Uh, Dr. Geraldine C. Pryor is an American-born Canadian endocrinologist and medical doctor specializing in menstrual cycles and the effects of hormones on women's health. She is world-renowned and a leader in understanding and treating perimenopause and menopause. She is also the founder and scientific director of the Center for Menstrual Cycle and Ovulation Resource, which is called SEMCOR, and they have quite an extensive uh, website. Um, she is the author of three books, has over 200 publications, and holds six patents. Um, she's the real deal. And um, in your press kits is a wonderful insert that she has provided that gives a list of some of the alternatives to PMU drugs. Um, in talking with her, and uh, I know she has a big heart because Dr. Kelasami made the contact um, for her and invited her here on, on, on our behalf. Um, she has a very big heart. And uh, even though she's not a horse person per se, um, I think she has a real warm spot for animals, but she's a doctor first and foremost, and it'll be very interesting to hear um, her own views about putting equine estrogens in the human body. I asked her about, in introducing her, which she'd like me to mention, and she mentioned her children and her grandchildren, and she, and she said that... Um, the way I, she said, I, the way I do medicine is not to be the boss. I give choices to people and let them make their own decisions. But the key to that, I think, would be to make informed decisions. And that's what a lot of women are not given the choice. Um, her talk, the title of her talk, which I love, is an approach to estrogen appropriate for the 21st century. So you know that time is going to be an important factor in what she has to say because there's the old and then there's the new. So um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Geraldine C. Pryor from Vancouver. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to spend an hour or so with you talking about what's important and new in estrogen therapy. And I'd like you to understand where we've come from and where we're going. I can't be with you in person, but I'm with you in voice and uh, with you in spirit. So first of all, this work is coming to you from the Center for Menstrual Cycle and Ovulation Research. And we have the noble goal of both making new science and sharing that information with women. So please go to the website and share this information with those that you know, especially any women that are having any hormonal menstrual cycle reproductive type problems. So we're going to talk about what's new in estrogen treatment. And Bear with me because the way I'm approaching this is very different than the way that your doctors are likely to approach it. But I think, and I hope by the end of this talk, that you will understand that this now makes some sense in terms of women's life cycle, in terms of physiology, and in terms of what's important for general health. So we're going to talk about the historical how did we come to focus on estrogen as the important thing for women's health? We will then talk about what we now know about the partnership of estrogen with progesterone. In other words, two reproductive women's hormones, guys only have one, and how <laughs> they work. And then we'll talk a little bit, not too specifically, about the good reasons in 2015 to use estradiol, progesterone, or combined treatment. What, when, how, and for how long, and how to stop. But all of that information is also in your handout. So if we have to go a little quickly, don't worry. And finally, I'd like to reset your consciousness before we go to questions about women's health beyond hormones, because we tend to focus on one thing and that's not appropriate. So before I start, let me say, using equine 
uh, estrogen is like driving a Model T down the Audubon. It is that stupid. <laughs> and, and the complexity of human physiology resembles this beautiful old Gary Oak branch. It is, it has a history and I think it's important that you know it. So first of all, let's talk about the outmoded things about estrogen. Well, first of all, I think one of the reasons we have focused on estrogen is that it was discovered first. It was discovered in the mid twenties. This was a time when prominent people were eating testicles from animals in order to make them virile, uh, for example. <laughs> so just, just so you get the historical context. Already by five or six years after estrogen was first isolated and discovered, there was a book written by the guy who brought us PMS, Dr. Franks, um, called The Female Hormone which implies there's only one. But that's nonsense because careful people for decades had been, as soon as they had a microscope, they put down the microscope and see that there were two different processes that happened within ovaries that up. And they were clear that, that the ovary was making two different hormones. That had been known for decades, but progesterone was discovered by people in Germany and the US in 1930. So by the time it was discovered, estrogen was already the bee's knees. And there was an additional disadvantage, and that is that when they tried, when they gave estrogen by mouth, it worked, it did things. But when they gave progesterone by mouth, it didn't work. It got broken up into bits and pieces and no longer was an active hormone. So that's how we got this whole industry of knockoffs called progestins or progestogens because the natural progesterone wasn't very bioavailable by mouth. I'll tell you about how that was changed later. And so we're setting the context of a, of a rather, well, think of flapper estrogen in the 20s. Now, first of all, estrogen is really three hormones. And when I'm talking about the one that's part of the menstrual cycle, I will call it estradiol, or as you can see, the abbreviation is E with a small two. That's the ovarian hormone of a menstruating woman, estradiol. Estrone, or E1, is the hormone of the menopausal woman. And estriol, E sub 3, is the hormone of the pregnant woman. And we need to understand that, but we can only measure estradiol in lab tests, and we've got only primarily estradiol as a hormone to be used for therapy. Now here is what we all grew up with, whether we know it or thought about it before, is this very stupid concept that a hormone makes us a girl, if you will. I don't like to think of, I mean, except for immature people, adult women are not girls, but though we're sometimes called that. But this deterministic notion that it's estrogen that makes us a girl is, underlying all of our, our cultural understanding of us. So now, a little bit of how that plays out in science as well as in therapy and advertising and stuff. So th these are the hormones, and don't worry about numbers, but across a menstrual cycle, you can see here estrogen in blue makes a big peak in the middle of the month and drops down and then the red progesterone here rises. Notice that the progesterone peak looks much smaller than the estrogen peak and that's the typical way in which the menstrual cycle hormones are shown. But that's 
misleading because if you actually plot the percentage change of each hormone, estradiol and progesterone, from their baseline, estrogen re increases from its low during flow about 220%. But progesterone increases from its low during flow about 1,400%. And that by itself tells you that progesterone is very important because the body doesn't bother to make steroid hormones, which are hard to make, unless it needs them. Now... The pharmaceutical industry was in on the ground floor. I told you that Organon, which is a classic hormone producing company in Europe, was the discoverer of estradiol. And the story of estrogen has been pharma, big pharma. And what they decided to do was to say, estrogen's going to make you young and, in parentheses, in a hushed voice, in a barroom voice, sexy forever. It's the elixir of youth. So in the mid-90s, a number of feminist scientists from the United States said, we don't give drugs without proving their effectiveness. And so the huge women's health initiative study was funded by NIH. The drugs provided by the company making pregnant mare's urine. And they set out to test the claim that all menopausal women should take hormone therapy, they called it replacement then, as a way to increase longevity, prevent heart disease, improve quality of life, and stay young. Um, the interesting thing is that I was forever skeptical of these ideas about estrogen being all the, doing all these positive things. And my colleagues got very frustrated with me. And uh, I said, okay, if this study proves that estrogen decreases heart disease and all of these things, then I'll believe it. And I wrote a, a letter to the editor in the New England Journal in 1992, March of 1992, basically saying that I thought the results of the Women's Health Initiative were going to be negative, and I was proven correct. So this slide is to say don't ever use the term hormone replacement therapy. That was the most brilliant marketing tool that the company making horse estrogen ever came up with because it's it's built on the notion that the low hormones that menopausal women have are normal and that they need to be brought back up to premenopausal levels and that's misunderstanding women's life cycle i'll show you in a minute so instead if you want to have some abbreviation call it ovarian hormone therapy so I wrote a book with a colleague, a social science colleague of mine, called The Estrogen Errors, in particular because women are being treated with estrogen in perimenopause when their own levels are sky high and, in fact, are causing the problems. Okay, so that's enough of the background. Let's talk about why these, what these two hormones do and why they're both important. So here's the, a key picture. Keep it in your mind. It's a cartoon. It's a, you know, just an example. But when we're kids, when we're babies, our estrogen levels are very low. During the teen years, they rise and often overshoot. An average across the menstrual cycle still is high. In the perimenopausal years, they become high and erratic. Now, if... if if I were drawing this properly, it would be up on the next story if, if the building you're in has another story. I mean, some women have double normal premenopausal high levels. And then gradually, over about 10 years, they, they go down. And then about a year to two years after the last flow, they become low again. And it's as normal for the 
estrogen levels to be low in menopause as it is for them to be low in childhood. Now, progesterone, estrogen's partner hormone, has a, a quite different pattern. Again, low in childhood and again, low in menopause, but it takes a long while. In, in fact, until about 12 years after the first flow, before most cycles are ovulatory. And any time throughout our whole lives, we can have a perfectly regular cycle and not make an egg and not release progesterone. But the other thing to notice is that in perimenopause, estrogen levels are, I mean, progesterone levels are lower. And therefore, at the two times of life when women are most symptomatic during the teen years and during the perimenopausal years, estrogen's too high for the amount of progesterone. So it's important to have both estrogen and progesterone to grow into mature women. Perimenopause is like the grand finale of the ovary, if you think about it that way, that we have all these follicles that contain eggs. Well, the job of perimenopause is to get rid of those follicles so we don't have a, a period, a menstrual flow, when we're in our 80s in a nursing home. So perimenopause means around because it extends before and for a year after the last period. It's the turbulent years of change before we become down to a low, normal, stable time of menopause. So here's the, the sort of um, lifeline of perimenopause. Early on in perimenopause, cycles are perfectly regular, but women start having trouble sleeping. They wake in the middle of the night for no reason, or they start getting night sweats before their period, or they start having heavy flow. This is the time when women end up getting to me for heavy bleeding. Then irregular periods called the early menopausal transition, then skipped period, late menopausal transition, the final menstruation, and some people call that menopause, but that is wrong. A year after is menopause, and that's our graduation. <laughs> now, in every single tissue in our bodies, both estrogen and progesterone work together. I'm going to show you some examples. So, these are our cells from the vagina, and there are three different kinds of cells. The pink ones here are superficial cells, and they, they, are, they need a high estrogen in order to be produced. The big blue ones with a small nucleus are called intermediate cells. And this, in fact, is the usual profile of the vagina during the normal menstrual cycle. Now, a few women in menopause will have only basal cells. They're small, they have a big nucleus, they look like this. And those women may have vaginal dryness. But most women have the majority of intermediate cells even in menopause. Now this I got from a, uh, from a calendar actually. And it's, if you look at, no, it wasn't a sexy one. It was a women's, a feminist one. This is a mature breast. This is what they call Tanner stage five breast with a small, darker areola, the area around the nipple. The nipple stands up. Um, but this breast is in the transition, and it's stage four. You see how the areola is ballooned out here a bit. It's unusual to have two different maturations in the same woman, and it kind of looks like she might be in early pregnancy. So she really is... Um, taking a while to get her breast developed, but at any rate. Um, 
the important thing to know is that estrogen makes the mound of the breast, the fatty tissue makes it um, voluptuous, if you will, but that progesterone is absolutely necessary for the development to the mature tanner stage five. Most people don't realize that. And in fact, I only learned it by working with, with biological men who believed they were women and seeing what happened. They came with breasts because they'd been on estrogen, but their breasts were like a man's breast with a tiny little areola about the size of a quarter. And as they went on progesterone, then the areola went through this maturation process. Now, in the human breast, here we're looking at slides, and you can see the arrow is pointing toward a dark red one. And that is a breast that was treated with an estrogen cream. And 19% of all the cells are these bright red, which means that they're growing rapidly. However, when you use progesterone cream, only 1% of all the cells are in the growing stage. So what actually happens is that estrogen makes the cells grow. Progesterone stops the growth and makes the cells mature. And that's a theme that is carried out throughout the body. Estrogen is the continual growth factor. Progesterone stops the growth and promotes maturation. So, so far we've been talking about the vagina and the breast, things that we think of as reproductive tissues, but estrogen and progesterone also work together in the heart, in the brain, in bones. And we're just starting to learn about this partnership in each of these tissues. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about bone. This is one of the, the areas where I've worked a lot. And bone renews itself or, or renovates itself by a process that has two main phases. You have to tear out the old, the backhoe, and, and once the old is removed, then you have to lay down the new. You know, put down in a, in a road surface, you have to put down the foundation and then lay the new um, asphalt. So we cannot think about estrogen and progesterone without thinking about both of them together. They work as closely as these two snakes are coiled together. This is an uh, original bark. The pattern for, for any kind of treatment needs to follow this menstrual cycle pattern. Now, the assumption we have, and this is a diagram, and this is an actual egg being released from the, you can believe it, is as Wikipedia wants, one of the ovaries releases a mature egg. Now that's, but in fact, that isn't true. Uh, at least a quarter of the time, an egg isn't released, especially in younger women and in perimenopausal women. So you can have perfectly regular, normal length, 28 day cycles that can have normal amount of progesterone, too short or short luteal phase, or not ovulation at all. Or you can have a long cycle, but an egg is still made, or you can have no flow for months at a time called amenorrhea. So which of these is normal? Only that one, only the, only the one here where there's an egg was released, but there's long enough time of progesterone. So what I decided a long, long time ago was to use progesterone in a cyclic manner. In other words, to try to mimic what was normal by starting progesterone on day 14, if you call the first day of flow day one, days 14 through 27. Now, in a woman with a regular cycle, this would be fine, but in a woman who isn't having a period, then you would start any old time and do it for 14 days or two weeks, stop for two weeks, and then do it again. So this is a kind of a 
a, a progesterone, if you will, or a luteal phase replacement therapy. Now, the evidence that that is positive for bones at any rate is shown in this diagram. It's a bit complicated, but bear with me for a second. So all of the women, and there were 61 in this study, had abnormal cycles, but they were perfectly normal otherwise. They were normal weight, they were non-smokers, they had good exercise, they had about a thousand milligrams of calcium a day, which is within the recommended range. Um, they were healthy, but they had abnormal cycles. And usually that's because of some kind of stress. So what I did was randomize women to get, and I had to use the progestin that's closest to natural progesterone, medroxyprogesterone, or MPA here. So these two groups both got active progestin, and these two groups got placebo progestin. But I got funding for this study from the Dairy Foundation, so this group got calcium, and this group got an additional gram of calcium. So what I think you can see, the green line here, there was an average gain in bone between 2 and 3 percent in the group that got cyclic progesterone and additional calcium there was an increase about one and a half percent in the women who got the cyclic progesterone without calcium. The calcium itself pre statistically prevented bone loss, obviously not in a few people like this. And those healthy women who weren't men were losing about two percent of their spinal bone. So this shows that progestin which works on a progesterone receptor on the bone building cells, builds new bone. And we should be using this therapy for young women with amenorrhea rather than, as we do now, putting them on the birth control pill. So there are a number of cycle-related problems absent, skipped, or irregular menstruation, and cyclic progesterone therapy helps. Heavy flow cycles, ibuprofen, and this is something every woman ought to know. Share it with your daughter, share it with your everybody you know. That if you have heavy flow, and you know what's heavy for you, but especially if it's flooding or you're changing your sanitary products every hour or two, one normal over-the-counter dose of ibuprofen, 200 milligrams, taken with each meal three times a day, will decrease flow by about half, a quarter to a half. And if that's not sufficient, then cyclic progesterone can be added to that. Menstrual cramps, they're really common, especially in teens, and they increase again in perimenopause. Ibuprofen, this time, is extremely helpful, but it needs to be given in a very different way. You have to stay ahead of the pain. So two tablets at the first go, and then another one an hour later if the cramps start coming back. And ahead of it that way, totally cramp-free. Acne pimples, hirsutism, unwanted facial hair. Cyclic progesterone works very well, especially with a medicine called spironolactone, which lowers male hormones. So I think we should be treating PCOS with cyclic progesterone and spironolactone instead of the birth control pill. Okay, so another, another thing that women use treatment for is hot flushes or flashes. So who gets them? Only the women with low estrogen out here? What do you think? No, they start here. And every time estrogen makes its big swing downward, women are likely to flush. So hot flushes, flashes, night sweats are basically the same thing. It's just that night sweats happen during sleep and hot flushes happen during the daytime. What causes it? Well, it's complicated. But whenever estrogen drops, 
there's a hormone called norepinephrine, which is a hormone that's a, a stress hormone of sort of like adrenaline, is released in the brain, and that causes this heat dissipation response, which is a hot flush or a hot flash. When that happens, every brain hormone neurotransmitter that we know about is released. It's, a, it's no wonder that they make us feel so agitated and irritable and uncomfortable. But the problem is that the more stressed, the more norepinephrine we make, the worse our hot flushes. So it be, becomes a re And the root of it is that the brain has gotten used to high estrogen. So that can be because a person's been on the birth control pill, because they're overweight and, and their tissues are making too high a level of estrogen, because they're not metabolizing estrogen right, they're inactive, they're getting environmental estrogens. And actually, Asian people have a, a enzyme, this enzyme, works better in them. So they metabolize estrogen more quickly. The brain doesn't get used to high levels and therefore they have fewer hot flushes. But this estrogen withdrawal, not low estrogen, but estrogen withdrawal. And in a man who's had, a, had prostate cancer whose own androgen or male hormone levels are lowered, that male hormone gets made into an estrogen in the brain which is why they also get vasomotor symptoms or hot flushes. Now, the hard part about it is that estrogen amplifies the stress response. So it's not generally making things better for hot flushes. It effectively treats them, but when you try to stop it, then you go through this estrogen withdrawal thing again. We can do a lot of things, however, that decrease our own stress response. And doing those things will help a long way toward making vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes better. So I did a study some years ago showing that oral micronized progesterone, this is the brand name is Prometrium in Europe, it's Eutrogestin. 300 milligrams at bedtime, and I'll tell you why it needs to be taken at bedtime in a minute, decreases hot flashes more than placebo. So here's the placebo response. Notice there's about a 22% improvement just from an um, inactive pill, but here's the progesterone response. So a highly significant decrease in hot flushes in healthy menopausal women. And this is what I showed you before, it even works in only a few women with very frequent and intense hot flushes. It's still statistically significantly effective. So I don't think anyone today should use any therapy if they need hormonal therapy other than progesterone which is safe and much more effective, can be stopped without problems. So in perimenopausal women whose own estrogens are still high, remember they're swinging all over the place, night sweats and sleep problems that start around flow are effectively treated with cyclic progesterone therapy. I should say I'm currently doing the randomized controlled trial to, to prove that that's correct. Heavy flow, again, ibuprofen is very effective. And progesterone, in this case, in a perimenopausal woman who's probably been having heavy flow for a while, it's high, I would say daily progesterone for three months. And then back to cyclic progesterone. Menstrual cramps, again, are effectively treated by ibuprofen. And migraine headaches that are not well treated with usual therapies in perimenopause, daily progesterone can help. So how about for early menopause? If menopause comes early, then we want to provide, in this case, 
a normal premenopausal environment. So here we can use the estradiol, the natural physiologic hormone, as a gel or as a, a, um, as a patch. In general, one pump days one through 25 of the month or a 50 microgram patch twice a week plus progesterone, 300 milligrams at bedtime for 14 days of each month. That's if a woman wants flow. If she says, look, <laughs> I don't want any period. If I can't have a kid, I don't want a period. Then it should be given daily. If a woman has hot flushes or low bone density that are not adequately treated, then progesterone daily plus estrogen. And when you want to stop estrogen, at, you need to stop at about age 51, decreasing gradually because remember that estrogen withdrawal is what causes all, all these stress hormone release and, and hot flashes. Use progesterone to help you get off of estrogen. And all of this is on the SEMCOR website. I know it's a lot of material. In general, for normal menopause, no hormone therapy at all is necessary. Night sweats, waking someone twice a week or more, um, are effectively treated with progesterone. We've shown that. And what I recommend is that once a year, a woman stop taking it and see if the hot flushes come back. If they don't, she can start again. If someone is young, has severe hot flushes and low bone density, progesterone daily plus cyclic estradiol, natural, natural estrogen. And after five years, stop the estrogen very gradually and continue progesterone as long as needed. So here's the, the reason that we give progesterone therapy at bedtime. If you look here, sleep quality in that study that we did was markedly improved by the progesterone therapy, non-significantly improved by the placebo. So progesterone has the lovely side effect of helping improve sleep. Okay, we focus on hormones, but hormones always carry some downsides. We're mucking about with nature if we use them without thought. So here are the two rules, actually three rules. Never take pill-type estrogens. I don't care if it's bioidentical. Pill forms of essence increase blood clots. Never take estrogen alone. Belongs with progesterone. Okay, never take pill estrogen, never take estrogen alone, and avoid estrogen or any form of estrogen until you've been more than a year after the last period. And never take estrogen in perimenopause. Okay, now to sum up. We know that there are many, many things, not necessarily easy things, that will help heart health not smoking, exercising regularly, avoiding diabetes, avoiding extra salt, so therefore avoiding high blood pressure. We know there's many things also that help our brain to stay young, like being active in our communities, uh, keeping our brains busy with meaningful work, talking with people, doing something that contributes to the society, the typical thing in China, at least in the old days, was that the grandparents took care of the kids and the shopping. I think you can see the vegetables in the bottom of this, this carriage here. Having meaningful relationships, people that care about you and that you care about. So in summary, first it came to equal being a woman but women are much more than our hormones. Women have two, have many life phases and in all of them, both estrogen and progesterone are normally working together. 
if there are abnormal cycles, symptoms in perimenopause or hot flushes, progesterone is effective treatment. Really, only early menopause needs estradiol plus progesterone. So women's health is helped by hormones, but is created by healthy habits, good friends, family, and a life of meaning. So if estrogen's what makes a girl a girl, progesterone with estradiol is what makes a girl a woman. Thank you very much.